So we'll start with the rapid fire app. Describe what your organization does in one sentence. Kuchava builds attribution and measurement technology for advertisers and publishers. How long does it take you to get ready in the mornings? I'm a pretty easy preparer. I um, am ready within 30 minutes. Um, I always cook breakfast for the family, so that's usually what takes the majority of my time in the morning. Most valuable skill you've learned in life? Gosh, um, patience and persistence. City in which the best kiss of your life happened? Mm, Newport Beach. How many speakers can you name at this conference? Oh. Like this. Thanks. 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 Um, I suppose you'll ask me to name them if I give them a number. I just, I pass. Okay. Uh, in one sentence, describe one problem that your organization is facing. In, um, organizational leverage to, uh, further scale faster. How do you relax? Mm. Um, swimming in the morning in the lake. A habit of yours that you hate? Habit of mine that I hate. I, um, I'm too, um, critical when things aren't perfect. Mm -hmm. Work from home or work from office? Work from office. Most embarrassing moment of your life? Gosh. <laughs> How many hours of sleep can you survive on? I typically sleep on five hours a night. Your favorite app? Um, probably... I'm pretty easy. Probably a combination of the feeds. So, Facebook and... Um, and LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Biggest mistake of your career? I don't know. Biggest mistakes are often opportunities. Um, I think I started my first company after being at Oracle for a couple of years. And sometimes I wonder if I should have stayed at Oracle for a few more years to learn more lessons. Um, but I've always liked starting companies, so I can't imagine that scenario. So maybe not a mistake. First movie that comes to your mind when I say the word technology. Mm, Star Wars. How many cups of coffee do you drink in a day? More like how many pots? I probably drink a pot of coffee a day, maybe four cups. Favorite Netflix show? Favorite Netflix show? I don't know. Uh, pass. All right. So that was the end of the rapid fire. So we're going to go for bigger questions. And these you can answer with as much ease as you like. Uh, what are your views on product management skills that one requires in the field of tech nowadays? Mm, that's an awesome question. Product management is, I believe, one of the most important roles in an organization. I think of product managers as miniature CEOs for their particular um, area of focus. And what that means is typically few people work for you, but it's your job if you're successful to be influential to everyone, ranging from engineering to marketing to you know, go to market, um, PR. And if product managers believe that their job is simply to write PRDs, they're not in the right business. If product management believes that their job is to do program management or project management, they're not in the right business. And equally, product management is also not, you know, pie in the sky, brainstorming in perpetuity and never getting anything done. It truly is like a cross-functional, strategically important role. And I think that is the success of technology companies today is your product team. And how does one go about looking for such a product manager in the first place? Uh, I think of product managers, as I mentioned, as, um, as miniature CEOs. And so um, I think it depends on the maturity stage of an organization. 
you can look for young, green, enthusiastic individuals who can fill important aspects of product management, provided you have the right leadership. Over time, I think what you want to do is really recruit uh, individuals who will likely be running a company in the next five to 10 years and think about that in that context. Um, and I, you know, nothing is perfect. I'm not suggesting that we have been perfect at doing that in, in at Cochaba, but um, I think that's the North Star that you should be driving towards if you're in a leadership role of a company. Apart from all the benefits, uh, do you think planning strategic partnerships may have a downside too? Yeah. I think if I understand the question correctly, I think the downside is you sell yourself out too short and too quick. Oftentimes, if you've got a great idea, <clears throat> you think, you know, who would value this, you know, who would benefit from this, and you identify the strategic partner candidate. And instead of building it, you effect effectively educate <laughs> the partner that you would otherwise have a lot of opportunity to emulate and replicate. And so I think there's a really important balance when you desire fast go to market. The tendency is to say, well, let's partner with this partner and they can help accelerate. But if you do it too early, then you don't actually give yourself the time to think through and to become pregnant with the vision and the passion for whatever that thing is without kind of handing off your baby to another partner. And a lot of people believe that making partnerships is the future, though. So what do you have to say about that? So certainly, organizations are far more loosely coupled mosaics than they were in the past, meaning partnerships are far more strategically important today than they were 10, 15 years ago. Having said that, it comes back to your North Star of what's your vision and what's your strategy and what's below the line, which is good opportunities for partnership, and what's above the line, which is what you have to own wholeheartedly and have it be yours and only yours. And so differentiating that it creates a really nice, clean governance framework to keep yourself accountable on what you're partnering on versus what you want to make sure you're developing yourself. Do you agree with this statement? The online gaming industry is creating a unique union between entertainment and skill. 100% and has been doing so for 20 plus years. Um, you know, massively multiplayer online games were the first social network prior to social becoming big. And what was underappreciated was that they were the first social networks because real community, real relationships were being developed around a common digital platform. And in the case of MMOs, it was stateful. You know, there was time-based sessions with raids. There was, um, you know, still still are, but, you know, that that arguably was the first rendition of Metaverse and love, you know, people love to talk about how Metaverse is changing, but this is really just a continuum of what happened in in games um, and went from MMOs to social games to mobile games and to now a whole variety of other types of games, but 100% um, agree with that statement. What else do you think is going to come from gaming into tech in the future? Uh, marketplace, commerce, you know, we've seen some of that with NFTs, um, specifically around um, thinking about in-game items as redeemable and transportable uh, goods. Um, you know, item trading has been around since Ultra Online and earlier. So that's, uh, you know, obviously not new. What is new is having it hit a mass uh, adoption curve. Interestingly, in our, in our business, you know, we're in the business of helping brands, big brands, identify what's efficient with regard to their ad spend. And um, part of that is owned media. So paid media is where you spend money on social platforms and, 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 and ads to drive adoption to your product or service. Owned media is where you have your own digital properties and you're promoting another digital property. And one of the areas of 
real growth that we believe in for 2023 and beyond for big brands is really around loyalty. And loyalty is just another version of in-game items. And the parallels are very consistent. And so in many respects, what we've seen in gaming are the pattern um, template for what we're seeing out of gaming using similar constructs. And we're certainly observing that. What do you think is the reason behind the enterprise software market gaining popularity? And what challenges did it face due to the pandemic? Or is it going to face yeah. the recession as well? So <laughs> Yeah. I mean, enterprise software is certainly not new. I would argue what's new is the way in which enterprise software is being consumed. So in client server days uh, through the 90s, enterprise software is what made uh, companies like Oracle become successful. Um, the compositing of the uh, framework of enterprise software, SaaS delivery, and um, some of the as-a-service-oriented aspects of enterprise software certainly make adoption much easier. The, the problem, I would argue, is that it's made it so easy that you've got companies that are not companies, they're features. And uh, one of our favorite phrases in the company is FNAC, which is feature, not a company. Um, meaning, well, what should be a standalone thing with interoperable partnership capacities versus what is better for the brand or the um you know, the consumer of that enterprise software as a, a roll up of, of capabilities. And so that's an important differentiator. Building features is one thing, but accumulating customers is another. If you've got a, an advertiser or excuse me, if you've got 10 startups and all of them want to sell into the fortune 1000 customer base, they all have to replicate an SDR framework a go-to-market framework, um, a, a mechanism to reach out and engage uh, with those prospects. They all have to get uh, DPA agreements. They have to get through legal. They have to uh, go through an onboarding process. And if all 10 of those companies are relatively in the same category, they're going to be a combination. And so the question is, who's going to get out first and really own the distribution channel with the customer? And, and uh, the answer to that will be who the winner is for the category. So what do you think of the trend of micro SaaS? Like so many features turning into products and people thinking that that's going to be the future as well. Yeah. Well, as a, as a company um, with you know several hundred employees, we have lots of tools. And I would argue we have more tools than we should have. But there will be an individual who thinks that that tool is going to make them more successful and they'll throw a credit card down, it's below a threshold, and so they get started. And then it gets adopted, and maybe it uses, and it's got an integration strategy. Everything about your question is applicable, and you can see why that um, takes fire. But in a world where recession is looming, um, subscription management becomes really important. Um, you know, our CFO is really looking at what tools are absolutely critical, what are we already getting from other scenarios, and we're tightening that belt. So, you know, when, when times are heady and exciting, it's great to, to create a business that may be a micro SaaS offering. But when unified ROI is an important attribute, if you can really hit scale with customers, you better figure out how you're going to be part of a bigger package. Um, our own technology is we sell into advertisers and brands you know, we provide media cost aggregation, we provide deep analytics, we provide attribution, we provide measurement, we provide data pipelining, uh, data syndication, data enrichment. Those are all individual companies, but we provide it in one platform. And so what we are able to tell the CFO as well as our customer, who's the marketer or the CMO, is that you get natural economies of scale by using our platform because it's all... In your opinion, how difficult it is to build a career in the business development industry? Um, I would argue 
that it's easy to get started in business development. It's difficult to build a career in business development. You're either a rainmaker and closing business and bringing in cash, or you're a talker. And ideas, I'm not suggesting ideas are a dime a dozen. I think there's a, a, an argument to that. That's not my point in this argument. Ideas are one thing. Execution on those ideas is an entirely different thing. And either you are, as a, as a career developed business development person, you're synthesizing ideas and synchronizing with teams to get things done, or you're bringing in money. And if you're not doing one of those two things with an outcome-based approach, you're not building a career. You're, uh, you're, you're dabbling in BD. And the last question for you kind of related to this is, what would you be doing in your life if not this? I really love what we're doing. Um, we not only build you know, measurement and attribution and tracking software. I'm very much a data person, visualization person. Um, you know, Kochava is bootstrapped. And, and what that means is we've had an awful lot of autonomy. Um, we're not being told to stay in our lane by venture partners who are on our board who are telling us we're not allowed to deviate or think about other areas. We've ended up building a layer one blockchain technology uh, we have built a consent management framework that ended up being really beneficial to our brand customers. That's a separate whole you know, category of business. Um, we built a, a data business because our customers asked for it. Um, and, and so to the question of what would I be doing, I'm, I'm satisfying my curiosity and desire to do lots of things because of the framework in which we're working and the kind of company we've built. There are times when I employ people on the team and bring people on the team and they're not used to the autonomy of things and diverse activities that we're doing. They, they're used to working for a larger company where they work on one specific swim lane and it concerns them and frustrates them that there are so many things that are going on. Um, but for the right individual, it can be, it can be pretty special. So if I weren't doing this, I would probably be doing something just like it, having the same kind of expansive charter. <laughs>